Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all of you in the room. Thank you for coming. Welcome to everybody uh, online. I hope you can hear. Uh, it's great to be here at UCL, and uh, I'm Tony Danko, Director General of the CBI. Uh, I'm doing all my own chairing and facilitating today, because to do otherwise would have been uh, ludicrously indulgent. But just to tell everybody what's going to happen, uh, I'm going to speak probably for about 20, 25 minutes, share with you the entire answer to the future of the British economy, uh, and then we're going to do Q&A. Q&A will, I'm afraid, just be in the room. Uh, but hopefully, uh, so start thinking of questions, please, to keep it active. Uh, and we've got uh, handheld mics so that people online can also hear the questions. So, welcome. Uh, anybody here from UCL? We've got some of the crowd from UCL here. So, it's very, very nice to be with you. Uh, an institution that for almost, I think, two centuries has been pushing the frontiers of knowledge uh, to benefit our economy, our country, and our lives. So I'm really delighted to be here at UCL. Most importantly, you are members of the CBI, uh, which is an impressive choice. So thank you very much indeed for having us. Uh, look, this, is, uh, this speech today comes after two years uh, in the job, where two years ago I made my first speech as Director General, uh, and I had an ambitious proposition that I put forward which was that the UK should have an economic strategy. Uh, something which, by the way, uh, other countries have, but we don't really do in the UK. Uh, but my call was very successful because we've now had three economic strategies from three prime ministers in two years. But the reality is none of them have ever really stuck. We did our part. We wrote a sort of microeconomic strategy for the future of the UK. It was called Seize the Moment. It set out our ambitions to have a more competitive, dynamic, and future-focused economy. We set out very concretely the economic prizes to the very pounds and pence for firms and sectors all across the economy. And we stand ready uh, to fold that into a set of new economic cabinet ministers as they work out the plan uh, in 2023. Uh, we keep talking about growth. Why do we keep talking about growth? I assure you it isn't about economics, though there's good reasons for it. It isn't about politics, though there are good reasons for that. It's about people. People in this country who've had pay rises, but not as high as price rises. Uh, people who know their jobs are changing and they want to be reskilled and upskilled for better paid jobs. Uh, this is about people who recognize that the health service needs more money, that our schools need more money, our transport systems need more money. But there isn't more money because there isn't enough growth. Uh, now, I am, uh, despite some accusations in the media this morning, I am neither a doomster or a gloomster. I am a boomster as the great Boris Johnson would say. Uh, and I'm not here today to talk the UK down. And nor am I going to talk our politicians down either. It's been a turbulent few years, let alone few months. And our ministers and our civil servants uh, have given so much of themselves and coped with incredible crisis very well. So although I do have some criticism of where we are, uh, and I do feel compelled to say it, none of it is personal. Driving up growth after 15 years of flatlining performance and in a parliament that is confronting a world of perma crisis is not easy. Uh, and some credit where it is due, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have done a really good job of stabilising the economy uh, after the fallout of the autumn. And the Chancellor in particular upheld high levels of capital spending, unlike uh, his predecessor, uh, George Osborne, at the start of the fiscal consolidation over 10 years ago, he upheld capital spending despite basically delivering a £55 billion consolidation in the autumn. And he's begun to sow some important seats to return to in the budget. <clears throat> and despite an election looming, I don't know about you, but I actually feel there is pretty large consensus in this country about how you get growth going. We need to get business investment up. We need the right labour market and skills, and we need to succeed in the growth innovation markets of the future. Everybody agrees about that. Now, the current CBI forecast is that the PM should comfortably hit his pledge of getting the economy growing this year. Uh, he'll hit it by 0.1%. Uh, 
But today I suggest that if our policies are oriented towards 0.1% growth, then it's the most we'll ever achieve. Because if you're going to overcome the headwinds firms face this year, you're going to need far more forward momentum economically. Uh, and that's really what today is about. Uh, it is a speech about solutions, about the tailwinds you create to overcome the headwinds. But let me start, uh, let me start out quite starkly by talking about some of the challenges on areas where I worry our economy is moving backwards, not forwards. In the areas of capital, people and ideas, coincidentally, the three core priorities of our Prime Minister set out in a speech, the Mays Lecture, less than 12 months ago. A brilliant speech, I would say, and I urge you all to read it. So let's start with capital investment. The CPI forecasts business investment to fall this year, as do all major forecasts and to still be 9% below pre-pandemic levels at the end of 2024. And across the country, I don't know about you, and some of you will be in the room, I'm speaking to firms who are actually putting investment plans on ice, and actually either because they're uncertain or because they're diverting cash to deal with higher energy costs, higher wage bills, and higher tax rates. Now, as Chancellor, uh, Rishi Sunak accepted that one of the major problems here is that the UK's tax incentive regime for investment is lower than the OECD average. He had a grand plan, one we agreed, agreed to go with, uh, to the consternation of some of you perhaps in this room, to put corporation tax up six points overnight. Six points overnight, which is coming at the end of March, but accompany that with an investment super deduction. And what that meant was that those firms who invest in Britain pay less tax than those who choose not to just to pay dividends. Now, I thought that was a powerful idea, but as of right now, only half the plan is going to happen. The six points up and the super deduction not to be replaced. Now, when we had the super deduction, the UK had the fifth most competitive business tax regime for investment in the OECD. In about two months' time, we'll drop to 30th out of 38th in the OECD, and our levels of business investment will be bottom of the pack alongside Turkey and Greece. In other words, our investment plan just became anti-investment. Now, on people and skills, everybody knows that this is getting harder. In the wake of the pandemic, tens of thousands of older workers have left the workforce. Uh, there is a growing number of people unable to work because of uh, their experiencing long-term ill health. And just when the NHS is on its knees trying to deal with current demand, we are asking them to solve those problems. Childcare is very expensive in the UK. It's amongst the highest in the OECD. Uh, and it's keeping parents who want to work or have some part-time work or work from home, it's limiting their ability to do so. Now, politicians on all sides don't want to use economic migration to tackle label shortages. Let's be honest, selling it to the public just seems too daunting. And on workforce skills, both government and business are failing. You know, just 24% of the UK's public education spending goes to post-secondary education and vocational training. That compares to the OECD average of 66%. It is the smallest percentage of all OECD countries. And I have to tell you, British companies in aggregate uh, are among the worst performers in Europe when it comes to investment in training. And those two things are obviously connected for reasons I'll come back to. Let me talk about innovation. Uh, here we have a real opportunity to scale up in many of our sectors, including technology and life sciences. But we have just been spectacularly overlapped and overtaken on green growth, by far and away the biggest innovation opportunity of the 21st century. We do really well in Britain at creating unicorns, firms valued at a billion dollars. But we struggle then to get them to decacorns, firm valued at $10 billion. Now, we're working with many of them to change that. And it's absolutely a passion of the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, and the Business Secretary. So I'm confident we'll make progress. 
We've done really well on life sciences in recent years, some very, very famous examples we're all aware of. Uh, and we want to grow life sciences further, but there are real barriers to that we need to be open about. The sector depends on the NHS to innovate in order to grow, and obviously they're really stuck with having that bandwidth to do so. Uh, and our companies, that are global companies we're trying to attract, are facing, frankly, very low and uncompetitive margins because of government procurement. So it's not straightforward, but it is a huge potential in life sciences. Where I'm far more worried, however, as I said, is complacency on green technology. This Chris Skidmore review, commissioned by the government, a Chris Skidmore, a Conservative MP, is pretty devastating. And it echoes our analysis, uh, some of which we're releasing today, on how the UK is now performing against our competitors on future green industries. Uh, we have some new data uh, that's come out today, and to sum it up, we are falling rapidly behind. Having been really the leader in the world on this for 10 years, we are now falling rapidly behind, losing out to the Americans and the Europeans, who are outspending us for sure, and I'm afraid also outsmarting us. We're behind the Germans on heat pumps, insulation and building retrofits, the French on electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and the US on operational carbon capture and storage projects, despite having a real advantage in the North Sea. And we're lagging all three on hydrogen funding. Now, this is stunning to many of us who have held up clean energy as the area where Britain could lead the world but it has changed in the last two years. We have lost market share, others have gained it, uh, and we estimate it to the value of about 4.3 billion pounds by 2030, lost literally in just the last 12 to 24 months. So look, the challenges are pretty big, and I'm really worried about the political response. The Conservative Party seems to be restarting its civil war on tax, some in the party are calling again for big tax cuts for voters this year as a quick growth fix. They are wrong. The Prime Minister is right. To deploy mass tax cuts now with inflation this high will backfire. In fact, it did just a few months ago. And so the PM has our full support on this one. But I reject a polarised notion that you have to choose between fighting inflation or growth? Or as the government seem to think that you must first bring down inflation before you act to get growth? Consumption-led growth is the wrong path right now, but investment-led growth is not only non-inflationary, it is totally essential to stimulate it now. Otherwise, you won't get good growth next year, where one would expect politicians would want to be having some good growth. And we need to send signals immediately to domestic and foreign investors that the UK is a place to invest now. The rest of the world, I'm afraid, is already off the mark, even whilst bringing down inflation. To do that, and this is really the crux of what I want to say today, we need a government to make big decisions, not small ones. Ones that change Whitehall. Ones that change boardrooms. And that's what I want to propose today. And I fear from my discussions with the government that their plans are simply too unambitious to get us out of the rut that we're in. Too small to overcome the challenges I've cited. What we need is bigger action and some solutions. Let's start on the solutions front with capital. The UK's problem of low business investment isn't behavioural. There's nothing about Brits that mean we don't want to invest like the French or the Germans. It's structural. And that's what makes the rationale behind the super deduction that Rishi Sunak first had absolutely right. It was so powerful. So this is very simple going forwards. Let's finish the job that the government started. We're proposing full expensing for capital investment. It's actually not about a more generous tax system. It's about using it in a smarter way. It allows firms to raise investment now by the government allowing them to have cash flow back to the firms right in the year they make their investment, not drip feeding the benefits, which we do sometimes up to 30 years. And that's critical to driving investment out of recession because it tackles the very reason why firms say they can't invest, i.e. cash flow, and gives them a benefit straight away. 
And the cost to the government, sorry for getting accounting on you, is largely a balance sheet one. Phasing the cash differently to enable people to stimulate growth now. Now, I admit that if it was a massive success story and everybody started investing at unprecedented levels, that would be expensive by the government, for the government, but unbelievably affordable given the amount of investment that we just would have stimulated. Now, this can be uh, a fantastic uh, conversation between tax accountants, but let me tell you why it's about more than that. If companies invest more, they create better jobs. If they automate more, then prices and inflation come down. They build better healthcare equipment for our hospitals. They build safer and better trains for our railway network and so on. Investment matters to people, not just economies. Uh, now, the government say they believe in this policy, in fairness to them, but they can't afford it. That's because they don't want the hit to the annual accounts. And I just don't think that's a good enough reason for the government not to bring their balance sheet to bear here to help Britain getting investing. But recognising their concern, we have a new proposal on this one. We're suggesting that they lay out an investment roadmap, basically to achieve full expensing within three years. And right away, by setting out that roadmap, building it up over three years, you would send out a very clear signal that the UK is committing to rewarding investment. Politicians love to use the line, Britain is open for business. It's very often hollow words. This would make it true. So investment. Let me talk about people and skills. More solutions. Uh, when it comes to labour market inactivity, we will have to be much bolder than we're planning because we start with one hand tied behind our back. The government don't want to use immigration to fill vital shortages. In which case, I understand that politics, but it means that our policies on long-term sickness, on benefits uh, and incentives, and on childcare, and on training, all these policies that boost labour supply have to be twice as bold as other countries. First, let's connect benefits and work so that people are able to return to part-time work without losing their benefits. Employers can really help with these kinds of pathways. On childcare, I'm afraid there will need to be spending on uh, more free childcare to really move the needle. The government are talking about doing this only with supply-side reforms, but supply-side reforms invented in Whitehall just don't look like they're going to cut it for parents across the country. On immigration itself, surely we have to be pragmatic. Britain doesn't need to go without fruit pickers, warehouse operatives, welders on a point of principle, right? It just needs politicians to do in public what they all admit is needed in private. Immigration that is fixed in short term, eases shortages and buys us the time to get our labour market balanced again. On adult skills, we do need to sit together, business and government, along with the skills sector, and make real change. In contrast to other European systems, when the UK government does spend money, it doesn't work with business to do it. The lifelong loan entitlement, one of their flagship policies, was created as a contract between government and the adult learner. It was not conceived as relevant to the current or future employer, which is a clear omission. And while our tax system does intervene uh, to address market failures and capital investment and innovation, it does the opposite on skills. In the UK, we give tax hikes, not tax breaks, when it comes to training. The apprenticeship levy forces companies to spend money on training. That is fantastic, but not their own training, other people's training, which is essentially a tax, not a levy. Let me be clear, at the CBI, we absolutely champion apprenticeships. For several sectors and for many employers, they are truly world-class qualifications and pathways to work. But they don't work for everyone. And it's not the only skills policy in town. Most firms just end up handing the money back to the Treasury. But I do want to talk to business here too, risking the wrath of members and some of you in the room. Uh, I want to say that we don't disagree with levying firms to spend more on training, especially after years of underinvestment. We think it's a good idea. 
It's just that to take money off companies to subsidize others is an act of economic self-harm by the government. And companies do need to spend more, however, on training their people. And I would welcome any initiative to make transparent what we as employers spend on our people. We all know it's a labor market where at the moment the candidate calls the shots, right? There is fierce competition among firms on their employee value proposition, right? Their EVP. And I say today that any EVP that doesn't have substantial investment in skills development will fail. You will fail to attract the people you need. The market will weed out those firms that underinvest training in people, and so it should. Finally, I urge the government to have one labour market strategy with one point of accountability. Today, it sits with the Home Office, Bayes, the Department for Education, the Department for Work and Pensions, the Health Department, the Cabinet Office and the Treasury. A very simple maxim, when everybody is accountable, no one is. And this stuff is now critical to our future growth as an economy. Third one, innovation. As I said earlier, I am confident that the government will act here. It's the Prime Minister's passion. And supporting him, we've got two successful entrepreneurs leading the Treasury and the Business Department. Uh, now everybody, especially politicians, loves a tech startup or a photo with a robot. It's their absolute favorite. But you know, rather than just glamorous inventions, innovation should encompass and improve the competitiveness of our whole economy, every region and sector. So what would it mean to go forwards on innovation? Well, first, let's double down on that life science vision to ensure the sector uh, doesn't leave Britain, but stays and grows. Secondly, let's get serious about the Prime Minister's ambition to turn the UK's billion dollar companies into $10 billion companies. Our President, Brian McBride, is inviting some of the UK's fastest growing companies to join a new project from the CBI, Project Decacorns. And together we will set out how the UK can grow global champions in the digital space here in Britain. And then, probably most of all today, let's get back to winning, not losing, in green by making smart regulatory changes and using public money specifically to unblock private sector investment. Look, we've done this already in offshore wind. We can repeat that successful formula. And this year, we at the CBI are going to prioritize green growth as the major propeller for the UK's future competitiveness. As I said on media this morning, this is the next financial services for Britain. It is of that order of magnitude. We really believe we can continue and extend our leadership in the, on green growth, as we did, by the way, when we were the first to set net zero targets. But we are on the verge, I'm afraid, of being relegated from the Champions League by the Americans and the Europeans, both who are now in an arms race to win global share. Not only are they spending more money, they're also abandoning regulatory barriers, including state aid, to win the prize. That's a lesson for us about what it means to go big. The UK government protests that it's increased its green investment. And that's true. But we are not racing against ourselves. And we are not racing against the past. We're in a race with our competitors. And this is where the lion's share of growth will come in Britain, or not come. Look, here's how we'll win. I'm about to sum up an incredibly complicated uh, green strategy for success uh, in just a paragraph. Look, first you have to build off unique strengths, right? Our geological advantages in wind and carbon capture, right? That's one of our strengths. Uh, our science base in universities, such as this. Uh, our world-class finance market. And the early leadership, actually, of UK companies across all sectors to decarbonize. Those are some of our advantages. Secondly, we need to make smart fiscal choices rather than believing we can outspend the competition. We clearly can't. But we do need to put funds into immature technologies where the market can't yet act. We should continue to use this mechanism, contracts for difference, which essentially government underwrites the risk of new technology markets across all the technologies like we have in wind. 
And we need to create positive incentives for local content rather than protectionism, as we've seen in other places. And finally, I'm afraid it is time to confront regulation, planning and consenting that hampers our progress. Put simply, we in Britain are world class at being an impossible place to get any projects going, nationally and locally. From laying connectors to the grid, to building EV charging infrastructure, where the Spanish are four times as fast. And that's before you even get to the controversial subjects of onshore wind and solar. Look, I know that subsidies and planning reform are anathemas, both of them, to the Conservative Party. But I'm afraid refusing to budge on both uh, when it comes to green investment is just making a mockery of the government's desire to be one of the most innovative economies in the world. Leading on from this, I just want to say one thing about the UK's regulatory divergence from Europe. I'm going to try and do it without saying the B word. Now, the government is convinced this is a major opportunity for growth. And I agree that it could be too. But it's a bit more complicated than simply scrapping overnight many of the terms of trade we've used for decades. Because divergence is high-stake politics and high-stake economics. Often we don't consider how the EU will respond uh, and where they could outcompete us. We also need to recognise that divergence usually can shrink your market size or it doubles the amount of red tape. The party of deregulation risks becoming a party that's doubled the amount of regulation that we have. So while it can definitely work, right? Witness the historic success of the City of London. Witness our rapid COVID vaccine approval. You have to run the numbers to make sure it's not an own goal. And it will take far more than a regulation play, by the way, uh, to make sure the UK wins its share of global sectors. So do it smart, do it where appropriate, and do it when government and business agree the time has come for ball joint action. Now, the Chancellor has appointed Sir Patrick Vallance to lead a thorough review of, into securing possible prizes in five high growth sectors. This is the right approach. Serious analysis, consideration, engagement with business. It is the complete opposite, in fact, of the retained EU law bill, which says that at the end of 2023, all retained EU law in the UK expires. And that is creating consternation for UK firms. Companies are already asking us, will we really erode maternity and paternity rights? Or health and safety standards like the General Product Safety Directive? or rapidly change our regulations on reach, which governs the use of chemicals with billions of industry costs, or create the potential for firms to be underinsured because it's harder for analysts who don't know what laws will be retained to effectively price risk into products. If I can put it more crudely, do we really want to subject the public and industry to another round of mass confusion and disruption? just as we're trying to exit recession. Instead, I say, let's review, retain, reform, and where appropriate, repeal EU law the valance way, smartly. Not the retained EU law way, foolishly. So as I come to an end, I realise that this speech will be seen by some as a harsh analysis of where we are. I don't believe the political leaders will love it. But we say it, because we think it's true. Because we don't feel any politician can respond to Britain's current problems without growth. And mostly because we believe that both parties are today led by pro-growth politicians. This should be a maximum opportunity moment. And I've tried not only to criticise, but to channel Lord Young, an alum of this place, who we recently lost, who famously stood out for bringing solutions, not problems. Here are the solutions for government. Transform our tax system to reward those who invest. Be bold on labour shortages. Fight back on green innovation. Don't be outspent, outspent and outsmarted by the competition. And don't be reckless on regulatory divergence. Be ready. And I also challenge business, many of you watching, to also adopt solutions 
Invest more in capital, people and ideas and persuade your shareholders of the merits. As part of that, train more or fear losing the war for talent. On innovation, accelerate your net zero journey. The politicians may be waxing and waning, but this is just a simple question now of corporate strategy. If you're not racing to a green future, you are behind. And let me finish where I started before we take questions on how we respond to a world of Brexit, COVID, climate change, global inflation and an energy crisis. All reasons, I would suggest, why business as usual politics and business as usual economics won't be enough. Why small decisions now and in the budget ahead just won't cut it. Uh, I'm going to st stop asking for yet another economic plan for now. But we won't stop asking for economic action on capital, people, ideas, bold changes that get the UK back in the game and drive a force of economic momentum that does more than get you a scrap of growth by year end. It gets you out of the rut and charging forwards to build the economy and the country we all want to see. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's do some questions again. If you've just joined online, sorry we can't take questions online, but hopefully uh, your colleagues in the room will ask tough questions uh, and we'll see, we'll go maybe for about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, folks at the front, like if you can say your microphone is coming so people can hear you online and if you can say your name and where you're from. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Adam, yeah? Uh, yeah. Adam Payne from Politics Home. Uh, you spoke in your speech about how the government should be bold. Uh, when it comes to migration rules and addressing gaps in the workforce, at least in the short term. Now, you mentioned fruit pickers. Um, what are the other sectors' jobs that are particularly concerning for you in regards to the issue of uh, labour shortages? And you touched upon the political obstacles to this. You said how it's a difficult political argument to make. Can you sort of um, be more specific? Is this a home office thing? Is this the home office that's and that's usually, that's often what's said, is the Home Office blocking this? On immigration. Um, on immigration, is, is, is it the PM being nervous about the Brexiteers in his party? What's your view on why this is so difficult for the successive Conservative sure. Prime Ministers? Uh, well, look, I could give you a list of professions and jobs that I think are missing, but I, I don't need to, because we have a mechanism that does this entirely independently which is the Migration Advisory Council, who should be frequently asked to produce a shortage occupation list. And they haven't been asked for over two years, and there isn't one coming uh, in, in the next few weeks. Uh, we need to do the work, right? This is a very, very straightforward system. Uh, we turn around and we say, right, what skills does the country need? What skills have we got at home? For the skills we don't have at home, i.e. the shortage occupation list, let's use migration. And I'm completely relaxed about turning around and saying that migration can be fixed term and the government can put in place other strategies to get more welders or butchers or whatever it is we need. Uh, and by the way, when you talk to politicians, they all agree this is entirely uh, reasonable. But it's not the process we follow because I think, I don't just think it's about the Home Office. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do sometimes worry that we ask the Home Office to be in charge of immigration which in turn almost makes a statement about it's a, it's a security issue, right? Ideally, immigration would sit within an economic ministry because we see it as a growth issue, or it sits with the education department because we see it as a skills issue. So I don't just blame the Home Office, although I do find that sometimes they don't think enough about economic opportunity. I just think politicians today, uh, probably because they hear it from their focus groups, uh, just don't have the courage to confront people with this reality and they probably feel that doing it in a nuanced way is impossible which i think is wrong i mean when you think back to the hgv driver uh shortage about over a year ago i recall a british public saying this is ridiculous right this is stupid right we're taking this to the extreme and so i think we should be able to have an open honest conversation with people to say look we're clearly short in the labor market. We've had a massive hit to our labor market from the pandemic. We are gonna use immigration. It's going to be fixed term. In other words, they're gonna be temporary visas to help us out. People are absolutely used to this in the NHS and in social care and they welcome it. And then we're gonna put in place strategies to get more skills. I don't think our politicians are showing courage. 
I think they're trying to change the conversation. Yeah, microphone back here. Um, Jack Barnett from City AM. Um, you've obviously emphasised with a lack of business investment in this country, and that's something which has been going on for nine or ten years or so now. Within this big plan, is the Bank of England almost emerging as the villain in here? Obviously, they're raising interest rates, they're trying to battle inflation. That's going to make it quite tough for businesses to lead this investment boon if they're going to be taking on debt at quite a substantially higher interest rate as well. Yeah, look, this is why economics I've always felt is like a game of clutch control, right? Because we need higher interest rates to bring down inflation. I think that strategy will work in bringing down inflation. It has a particularly bad knock-on effect in terms of SMEs who are looking to borrow to invest. Uh, some SMEs, some bigger firms already have the resources to invest. The question is, are they confident enough about Britain? Or if they could be putting their investment elsewhere, uh, would it have an impact? But look, I, I think the Bank of England have no choice but to increase interest rates to bring down inflation, because the sooner we bring down inflation, uh, the better for everyone. Uh, and I just don't want to let government off the hook when it comes to our investment climate, right? I think the tax framework does make a difference. Having a very clear growth strategy in major sectors that are attracting global investment uh, does make a difference. The 130 trillion dollars that Mark Carney talked about looking to go somewhere in the world for green investment, right? The money is there. You ask anybody in the city of London about is there finance for green growth, they'll tell you there are it is a mass of finance available for green growth. And the Bank of England uh, lending rate has got nothing to do with that. Now, there are some firms who will not get investing until interest rates come down and the cost of borrowing goes down. But there's a heck of a lot we could be doing before we get to that. Let's get some more stuff from around the room. Lady here, if you just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Shazia Ijaz from the Recruitment and Employment Confederation. Um, completely agree with the point you made about needing much more joint up cross-departmental uh, government thinking about labour market issues, training, um, immigration, all of those things, and bold change within Whitehall. Um, do you get any sense that there is an appetite for looking at some of the the more sort of the mechanisms of Whitehall and how policy is constructed for that purpose of economic growth, because it seems like there's never quite the change we need there. Well, look, I think the, I think the Chancellor uh, cares very deeply about this issue from my conversations with him, and he is actively working uh, with the Department for Health and the DWP on some of the sickness, in particular on sickness related issues. Uh, and I very much hope that they move forward on that. I'm a little worried they aren't engaging businesses more because how you really, you know, the good pathways that allow you to reabsorb people who've been on long-term sickness back into work, right, they're complicated. Any employer in the room knows that actually, just because the government, I don't know, tweaks the incentives a little bit, it's not as simple as everybody comes flowing back and off to work we go, right? It's quite complicated, but you need to set up the right structure of job. You need to put in place the right sort of package of care and support. So I think they're all sitting in a huddle right now in Whitehall. Work, they're taking it deeply seriously. They want to work on answers. We'd love to talk to them about them because, as everybody here knows, really absorbing people into the workplace their decision to work how many hours or their decision on how they get paid and how that relates to the benefit system and universal credit. All these things are issues employers and employees deal with every day. A worried Whitehall doesn't have enough insight into them. And the sooner we can talk together, the better, I think. Let's do some more. Gentleman at the back and then gentleman here with the hat. I feel like the uh, question time uh, moderator. Gentleman with the hat. But le let's do gentleman at the back first. Um, Tim Morris, Associated British Ports. Um, we are as much a green infrastructure company as a um, transport hub provider. So very much support your views about really getting back into a leadership position on green growth. Um, a lot of what you said resonated. I just wondered whether you had any particular things in mind about using green growth um, to drive 
jobs and, and investment. We see a lot of a lot of potential in the infrastructure space, obviously, and obviously there's also a crossover with the, the full expense of investment that you mentioned as well. But anything particular you wanted to bring out that you would think would really make a difference? Well, look, I think, uh, yeah, we keep talking about green jobs. The best numbers I've seen on green jobs have actually been in relation to retrofitting. And we're really nowhere on energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is literally the most, uh, I think uh, somebody told me, it's the most obvious public policy answer in public policy, right? Because we may have got away with it this winter when it comes to, although not today, but when it comes to wind and temperature. But the long-term solution to people bringing down their energy bills, and this applies for businesses as well, by the way, I was really upset the government didn't make enough moves to help businesses uh, install energy efficiency measures is for people to build energy efficiency and that has a real growth opportunity in terms of jobs but you're right uh you know when you go to parts of the world that uh, you know very well in abp you know i was recently up in the humber uh where you run that port and the potential for the northeast of england in terms of job creation value creation from the fact that we have first of all one of the most high emitting corridors of europe right next to the wells in the North Sea where you can put that carbon back in the ground, that will be transformational for the northeast of England in terms of jobs, in terms of firms, in terms of global investment and value, as you well know. On the, on the west coast, if you go across to sort of uh, the Mersey, they're talking about tidal power success. That's what's exciting about the green economy. Unlike financial services, which frankly was a story of growth predominantly in London, this is a story of growth everywhere, including for jobs. So, look, the, we have more detailed work done on exactly where the jobs can come from and the skills you need. But I would say, first of all, energy efficiency is a no-brainer. Secondly, uh, these major sources of clean energy investment, particularly in different regions of the country where you'll have ports, uh, they are genuine added value creators in the economic sense of the word. So thank you for your question. Gentleman with the hat. Thank you. It's uh, Richard Keen and Pellery AI. Um, we're an AI business and we help businesses take up AI for their own benefit. But we see some, a dark cloud on the horizon. We have lots of in initiatives which are designed to get people to utilize possibly the greatest tool available for profit. The thing that we can use to build better, greener is AI and machine learning. Yet we are facing a regulation which seems to be a bit myopic and believes Hollywood and thinks that machine learning is somehow some kind of sentient being that is going to take over the world. Well, you have to trust me on this, but you're more likely to accidentally learn to play the violin than to accidentally create the sentient being. It's not on the cards. It isn't going to happen any time in our lifetime. Yet we're facing this bill that's saying, oh, let's just take every kind of crazy thing and phobia that's possible and try and pack it into a legislation. And what I would say is, think about this. We have an incredible opportunity for Britain to grow. In every angle you can think of, green growth, education, healthcare, you name it, it can benefit from this technology. We have a program that we're starting up, a thousand kids in AI. And this is something that we've been writing people into to just show how easy it is to get into it. It's not something impossible. You do not need a PhD for this. Yet, instead of actually making it easy for Britain to grow in this respect, we are facing paranoia. We're yep. facing an industry that's been tarred with a brush, being found guilty of something it has not done. Yep. What I am also saying is I'm not saying, oh, it must be a free for all. I'm saying when we process data, we must be accountable. If you use AI technologies in healthcare, you are responsible for healthcare outcomes. Yep. And that is the regulation. If so you look, use it in financial services, the same. Look, I don't have a completely, you, you are more of a, a subject expert than I am. What can I say though, in, in some of the issues you raise? First of all, uh, I think Britain's backing AI big. I think there's a sense that the new wave of digital technologies Britain does have inherent advantage over compared to the last wave where we essentially lost out to the west coast of the United States. So I certainly think government believes uh, in fostering these technologies. Secondly, uh, regulation coming early in the adoption curve is always a worry. 
right? I think the truth about new technologies is you do need to think about regulation, but later in the adoption curve. So I would share some of your concerns. Thirdly, in general, there's a terrible thing about regulation that I have to say, which is whenever I talk to uh, politicians, particularly conservative politicians about regulation, they say the problem is Europe. And in most areas of regulation, the problem has nothing to do with Europe, right? Most of the regulatory barriers on business, on innovation, are made by British lawmakers in a British parliament and implemented by British regulators. Usually, in my view, they are overprotective of the consumer. Uh, and in case of some of the online safety bill discussion, uh, I think overly protective when it comes to thinking about that balance between child safety, which is obvious, and, uh, and innovation and growth. So I can't give you specifics on your AI point, but you're right, there's a risk that we put ourselves in the wrong place counter to some of the major strategic objectives of the government. So I think it's a good shout out. Let's do one more question and then I think we need to wrap up. Anybody else with a question in the room? Uh, we have two, so I'm gonna take them both. This gentleman with the white shirt and then gentleman with the white jumper. Hi, uh, Robert McElveen from the Mineral Products Association, so we're the trade body for concrete, cement, quarrying, aggregates, that kind of stuff. Um, just really a question about uh, planning for not for, for not for housing, but for everything else that relies on planning seems to yeah. be a huge barrier for growth uh, in our sector. But also pick up your regulatory point about like, the practice of regulation on the content of it, in the sense that the regulators tend to be tend to be struggling with their workload to some extent. And our members often find it takes a very long time to arrive, usually the right answer, but it usually takes a very long time to get there. Yeah, look, you're completely right. I mean, we, uh, I remember this funny bit where I think I'd just been in the CBI for a few months and we were doing our first budget submission. And in there was a line that I read that says, we need to spend money on more planning officers, which just didn't feel like a sort of business that you're right, let's have more bureaucracy. And I thought, well, do we really mean this? And of course, then I discovered what you know well, which is that particularly on local planning, uh, there simply aren't the resources. We simply don't have enough planning officers. Uh, and we've lost actually a, a generation of planning officers who've retired. So we're gonna have younger planning officers who are going to feel less confident. Uh, and I think it's a real problem. I say we need more bureaucracy on planning. We need more planning officers, we really do. And, and listen, I understand there are complicated, uh, major political challenges with planning. That's not one of them, right? And it would speed up a hell of a lot. Last question, gentlemen here. Hi, I'm um, Sam Forstick from Raconteur. Um, kind of talked a lot about uh, how the government can help tackle uh, the issues we're seeing in the labour market and in terms of the vacancy rates. But um, how much of the responsibility lies with businesses, do you think, in order to explore new talent pools and offer part time or flexible opportunities for people that are maybe reluctant to get back into the workplace? Yeah, look, I think that is right. And the truth is, business has sort of been getting on with that, right? I mean, as you know, the labour shortage problem has been so profound that most of our members have been trying all kinds of things. And, and every time for the last 18 months that I've done a round table with businesses around the country, it's almost all they talk about. First of all, labour shortages is the biggest issue for companies, for sure. Secondly, all of them are trying different things. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's possible that some companies will turn around and fold their arms and say, we've got labour shortages, the government must fix it. And there are some companies who do say that. But most companies are coming up with some of the ideas we're talking about, childcare, interrelationship with universal credit, uh, new pathways back to work, uh, new mental health services and so on, because they've tried these things and discovered these are barriers. So look, I, I think on all people related issue, uh, the answer is government and business working together. I think government will make, look, government made really good people policy during the pandemic, for example, the furlough scheme, because they had conceptual ideas, they came to people like us and said, we're gonna try this. And within a half a day, we had told them what would work and what wouldn't work, right? Because we've got people like you at the end of the phone who tell us very practically what will work and what won't work. When it comes to labor shortages strategies, you know, we've got hundreds of HR directors at the end of the phone who'll tell us, no, we wouldn't do that, or yes, we really like that. Uh, and so I want, to I want to find good policy answers in order to unlock good private sector answers. And I think we know what those are, so I invite the government to join us in that discussion. 
I want to thank everybody for on a Monday at 1.30, which is the most curious slot. Then again, if you're in town on Monday at 1.30, then, you know, that's already curious in today's world. But I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Uh, for everybody online, I hope it was a decent experience. Uh, if not, everybody should come back into the office. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, do send your thoughts, do share them uh, with us. And thank you to UCL above all for hosting us today. Thanks, everybody. See you.